know, one of the things we hear a lot is people buy from people they like. But the flip side of that is people also buy from people who like them. Customers need to feel connected to the company, to the brand, to the overall experience. You have to understand what your story is, but you also have to understand how does that relate to your customer story, right? Because every customer is different. They have their story. Hey guys, if you're enjoying these episodes here of our Unfiltered Podcast, be sure and join us live in Las Vegas because you think it's fun watching, it's gonna be a way more fun if you're there with us in the audience. Have a glass of whiskey and some good conversation. Get registered at epic2020event.com. Gentlemen, long distance uh, toast over there, G-Man. Pass that down for me. By proxy. So uh, here we are in beautiful Scottsdale doing another round of uh, unfiltered, sketchy as it may be. But uh, before we get started, G-Man, talk to us about cigars and uh, uh, adult beverages. Well, we're working on uh, a Cohiba, and uh, I believe, uh, what do you have? What do you I smoking? got a little Macanudo Hampton Court. Macanudo, yeah. And uh, this is a George T. Stagg Sr. It is something to behold. Not a junior, a senior. Senior. And uh, this, this is a very, very strong bourbon. <laughs> and when it I say strong, that. I mean strong. Yeah. And uh, it is, uh, it's got a little sweetness to it. Uh, pretty smooth. Yeah. But uh, you'll definitely know that, uh, that George T is in the house. Yeah. So. A little, little heat on the palate there. There's a little heat on the yeah. palate. Yeah. Shall we sample? Ah. Excellent choice, G-Man. Smell the caramel in that? Loving that. I know, man. Loving that. Good. You have not you have misled not, us yet. Not yet, no. No. Well, it's easy when I'm spending your money. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I love about you? You're fancy. <laughs> uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, we're here in Scottsdale at the Royal Palms. Or Royal Palm, is it singular or plural? Plural, right? Royal Palm. I have Palm. no idea. Anyway, Royal the Royal Palm slash S. Resort and spa. Beautiful place. We're in the Orange Grove. Got the desert. Lamps working now. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful night in the desert for sure. We're surrounded by orange trees. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, today, tonight, we should talk about uh, your brand, your company story. How important it is. How do you explain it to people in the sales kitchen table conversation? How do you leverage your brand story? How do you... You know, you had mentioned earlier in an in a off-camera conversation about what's your purpose? What's the point of your company? What are you trying to accomplish? So I think that'll be an interesting topic. And uh, I, I think contractors can, can learn a lot from understanding their brand story, refining that brand story, using it to sell, to market. So uh, G-Man, why don't you kind of get us started and talk to us about the brand story. Love to, love to. Yeah, so the brand story, I think, is probably... Uh one of the most uh, overlooked parts of the marketing philosophy of the contracting trade. Um, if you look at great companies, um, they, they always have a story. And so we obviously are selling product and services, but uh, it, customers need to feel connected to the company, to the brand, and uh, to the overall experience. So. I know you're going to talk about this, Wally, so I don't want to steal your thunder, but, you know, a, a company that's got an old, you know, let's call it a hundred year reputation. And there are some great companies in the industry. So uh, Atlas Butler in Columbus, Ohio is a great example of this. Um, you know, the company was founded in basically, I think, 1895. I, I might have that wrong, but it's right along the same lines of when Lennox Industries, Dave Lennox, founded his company. And in fact, Atlas Butler, they actually manufactured their own furnaces at one time. So locally, you know, the story over the years, uh, as they've grown the brand, uh, they've created a story around the history, you know, of how the company got started. Uh, we're not just good at putting in furnaces. I mean, we actually built them. And so, you know, the history of the company is based in that 120, 130 year history. Uh, so that's a company that's got a great uh, ability to look back at its legacy and its, in, its uh, tradition. Uh, and then there's a company that might be starting up tomorrow morning, and I don't have a 105-year, 120-year history, 
So I've got to figure out like what my story is. My story might be different. I've been in the business for 35 years might be the story. So what we want, you know, companies to think about is how do we actually, when we're in the home selling, you know, how do we craft, you know, that story that makes the customer feel emotionally connected to our company, our brand, and ultimately the salesperson. So uh, there's a technical term in marketing. We call it the evoke set. Evoke set means the emotional connection. Um, that's when, you know, Drew and I shake hands, we make eye contact. I love Drew Cameron because he's a personal friend, you know, so we have that emotional connection. So the evoke set is there. And so um, all, all people are part of a tribe. And so the human condition is based on the idea that emotion is fundamental, no matter whether you're an analytical personality or a driver, an expressive or, you know, an amiable. So what salespeople have to realize is, you know, how to tell that story. And the company has to realize how to tell that story. So we need to figure out how to work with companies to make sure that they have their brand story organized. Um, so I was uh, with a company last week and uh, it's called the Crown Group. And uh, the Crown Group is in uh, Akron, Canton, Ohio, and they've been around a long time. Uh, and none of their marketing material, none of their sales literature, nor their people uh, were able to answer the question. I said, well, you know, like, what's your story? Like, what do you tell people about Crown Group? Crown Group doesn't mean much to me, uh, but they have, you know, Crown Heating and Cooling. They've got Crown Real Estate. They've got Crown uh, RVs. I mean, they've got all these different businesses. Very successful company uh, and just awesome people. And so one of the things that we were working on is, well, you, you guys need to figure out what your story is. You have a great story, but you're not telling the customers what the story is. And so I think, you know, passing it to you, Drew, I think one of the things we have to do is we have to figure out what the story is. And then we also figure out how do we tell it? How do we actually tell it in the marketing side, uh, you know, digitally, you know, emotionally with sales personnel, technician selling, all, all of the above. So, Drew? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, great, great points. Um, and you have to tell, you have to understand what your story is, but you also have to understand how does that relate to your customer story, right? Because every customer is different. They have their story. Um, and you have to find ways to connect that story. You can't go in the house. You know, we, we're all very familiar with some of the, the organizations that have been out there in the 90s, and even they still exist today. And they teach a sales process that teaches kind of to the back of the you know, to the back of the room, right? Where it's just so standardized and we're gonna pull out you know, our book, our presentation book, our flip book, or, or our posters, and we're gonna tell the same story over and over and over again. We have one story told the same way to everybody all the time. And, and, and that's not what we're talking about here. I mean, you have to understand your story and then depending on your audience, you have to adapt it and tie it to their story. So you really have to understand their story. Whereas most contractors, they can't wait to get to the part of the sales process where they get to tell their story because that's where they're comfortable and that's where they live. But that's, a, you know, that's why there's also this disconnect. And, and so what we have found over the years <clears throat> is I become a fan of the customer story and then I understand my story like Gary's talking about and then I see what parts of it you know, are relevant and salient to that customer and I tie that in. <clears throat> so for example, um, you know, I was with a client um, just this past week and very large company. They also have multiple verticals. Uh, uh, one of the biggest ones they have is real estate, but they're also big into fuel oil, propane, security, uh, you know, everything, tree service. And they recently bought an HVAC company and we acquired two salespeople. One of them is, is the former owner and one of them is his former salesperson. And so I was riding with this gentleman, Dan, and I said, okay, we have a story as a company, right? This company's been in business since 1977. They bought the old uh, Esso fuel, uh, home fuel heating oil business from Esso back in the day. And I said, but you have been in business for a long time and you sold your business to this business. I said, so there's a story within the story, right? So not only does the company have a story, but you have a story as an individual, right? As a technician or as a salesperson when you're in front of a homeowner. And so I said to this guy, Dan, I said, um, I said, so what's your story, Dan? And so he, he just kind of rattled off his, his lineage, his history, his chronology, if you will. And I said, well, that's not going to really connect with a homeowner. I said, so when you're working for this company, I said, so what would be a story that you would think would be impactful to me as a consumer um, now that you basically no longer represent your brand, but you now represent this brand? And... So we started kind of kicking that around a little bit. And what we came up with is 
he says, I could have, he says, I, I went around the market. I was looking to sell my business. I was, you know, I had several suitors that were looking to buy my business. And he says, I could have sold to, to any one of these, you know, these you know, major companies in the market, but I picked this one and here's why I did. I, I thought, you know, not only would my customers be taken care of, but my coworkers would be taken care of. And if I can trust them, I believe that you can too. And let me tell you why. And so he could tell his story, connect it to the company's story, and then connect it to the customer's story. And, and I think that's important because today, more than anything, especially with millennials and Gen Zs, uh, you know, which is the youngest generation, it's kind of the consumers of the marketplace, they represent about 40% of the marketplace consumers, I think, by, uh, by next year. And millennials are the next big segment. The baby boomers were the biggest segment of the population, you know, in the, in the market, but they've kind of, you know, they've transitioned out and some of them are, are, are passing on, unfortunately. Um, so it's millennials and Gen Z's and what you come to find out is they want to know what you stand for. They want to know what you're about. What is your brand promise? What is your brand purpose? Uh, it's not just what do you do, but it's like, why do you do it? So, so let me take you outside the industry. Cause I think that as contractors, we, we don't have the best lessons inside our industry. Some of the best lessons are outside the industry. And the cool thing about that is, is you can see them every day, everywhere. All you got to do is open your eyes, turn on your television, open a newspaper, drive around town and you know, go online and you can see these things. Turn on Shark Tank, watch QVC and over and over and over again, you will see examples of this. So, for example, Bombas Socks, right? This is a company that was a Shark Tank company. Yep. And they went out there and they said, hey, we're going to sell socks, but for every pair of socks we sell, we're going to donate a pair of socks. Because what they found was that socks were the most needed clothing item any, anywhere in the world. Tom's Shoes was another one. For every pair of shoes we sell, we're going to donate a pair of shoes. The Body Shop. The Body Shop is all about like uh, cosmetics and perfumes and toiletries and things of that nature. They're all about being uh, sustainably uh, uh, manufactured. Uh, they're all about uh, maintaining forests, maintaining wildlife. Uh, they get, they've gotten into uh, human trafficking and making sure that that doesn't happen and everything you know, that they can do there. Patagonia. Patagonia is another one. They won't, they, they won't allow you to, they, well, they don't want to do anything with anybody who is uh, squandering resources. So, for example, um, I've got a client who has a race team and he knows somebody who has a race team and this other race team reached out and said, we want to get Patagonia to you know, create the jackets and, and uniforms for our, for our race team. And he says, can you connect me with somebody from Patagonia? So the CEO of my, of my client um, connected them. They reached out to Patagonia. And if you order like more than three jackets, Patagonia wants to know, like, what are you doing with these? And so they said, hey, we're going to do it. You know, we're going to have these for our race team. We want to, you know, we'll make you even a featured you know, brand if you like. But we want to, you know, we want to use your, your jackets. They, and so you have to submit an application. They did, they got denied because Patagonia felt that racing, using fuel for racing was a waste of natural resources. So they're all about the environment and whatnot as well. So what does your brand stand for? Like who are you involved in? You know, and what you know, causes maybe local, national, whatever, what, you know, what local charities and causes are you involved in? And, and so you, know, you see every year a lot of people get involved with breast cancer awareness, right? And I'm not saying don't do that, okay? Because that's an important cause and it certainly needs as much support as it can get. But that's an event. That's a moment in time. Now, if you want to do that all year long, that's great too. But what you find is that everybody's doing that. And so what I'm submitting, is, what I'm submitting to you is don't not do that, but can you find something local in the community that is impacting people at such a level that you do this because it's who you are, it's what you believe in, it's what you stand for. You're not doing it so that you get publicity and get accolades for you know, being the, the charitable giver in your community. Because what you're gonna find uh, out there is that people wanna do business with people who believe what they believe. And Simon Sinek talks about that all the time, right? He, he wrote the book, Start With Why. So what is your why? Why are you in business? Not for a profit, profit's a result, right? But why are you in business? What, what do you stand for? And so you're seeing companies like Chick-fil-A, right? Chick-fil-A, uh, Christian-based you know, company, right? Gives scholarships to kids, gives scholarships to uh, their coworkers to go to colleges, um, heavily involved in fundraisers in the community, heavily involved in local schools. They do like uh, 
Daddy Daughter Night and uh, uh, you know something with donuts with daddies and stuff like that. You know, very involved in family-based uh, you know type events and whatnot. So that's what I'm submitting to you is find something that you and your team can sink your teeth into that you'll have actually have fun with, but that can also involve your clients, right? And they'll rally around that. Right? So for example, I mean, and there's certain things that you could do for uh, you could get very involved in like let's say uh, around the holidays. You could do uh, a canned food drive where you're, you know, you say for every can, uh, you know, uh, every canned good or non-perishable food item that you donate, um, you know, up to let's say, you know, five or whatever, we'll give you five dollars off for every, you know, every canned good that you uh, donate, up to a, minimum, a maximum of five, and so you'll get twenty-five dollars off a of service ticket, and then you'll take all that food and you'll take it to the local food cupboard or something like that, right? So there are little things that you can do, but what's your overarching one? No, that's good stuff. And I, I think uh, you hit on a couple of really important points there. Number one, it's got to be authentic, right? Because people will see if you're insincere, Yeah. right? They won't really uh, respond to it if it is insincere. And I can give an example. Uh, we were talking earlier, I recently bought a G-Wagon and I was getting a lot of weird looks from people, right? that were concerned about my gas consumption. <laughs> so I put a bumper sticker on the G-Wagon that says my, my other car is a Prius, right? But it wasn't authentic and it's not going over very well. That's a joke actually. So I didn't put that bumper sticker on there. <laughs> but I, I do think it has to be authentic. And, and, but what you really touched on that I thought was important is the homeowner story is just as important as our story. You know, one of the things we hear a lot is people buy from people they like. But the flip side of that is people also buy from people who like them. Right, if you come to my house, I mean, I want to like you, but I want you to like me too if I'm going to give you 10 or 15 or 20 grand, right? And so I think by taking the time to learn the homeowner story, we're communicating, I like you. So I'm taking the time to get to know you and hear your story. And that can be so powerful as well uh, in earning business.